Hey, hey, friends and family. Hello, Harp family. You know, welcome to another session of Let's Harp About It. Um, yes, thank you so much for your uh, excitement. For those of you guys who, you know, express interest in this topic, uh, bam, I am so excited. I'm so excited for today's guest. Um, she is an amazing woman in her own rights, period. You know, just, ugh, bam, like, I, yeah okay I, I need to chill <laughs> but yeah i'm so excited to like have this time with you guys and i really appreciate you first and foremost for taking a moment out of your day to learn something new to learn to educate yourself today on a very important topic and today's topic would be on domestic violence and domestic abuse and you know kind of unpacking that and really like making it real and practical for us um because i know you know that's that you know, it's, it's it's definitely a topic that oftentimes is very difficult to talk about, right? And very difficult to get candid about, um, because it's uncomfortable. Like the many other topics that uh, we'll be discussing here on Harp, on Let's Harp about it, um, that that also like uh, overlap with the issue of harassment and assault, right? Because that's that's what Harp is all about, bringing bringing you um in the information that is needed to increase your education and awareness for harassment and assault related incidents, uh, both locally and globally. Because this is a global issue, right? This is it's not just an America issue. It's not just a UK or Asia or Africa this is a global issue right harassment and assault or just abuse in general occurs in has the ability to occur in every and any space and we want to make sure that we are empowering folks out there to be strong advocates for when you see and when you experience these these incidents because listen the goal is what to get to a zero tolerance, zero incident society. And so that starts with each and every one of us taking part, being intentional and active in eradicating this issue of harassment and assault, wherever you are, wherever you happen to be. And so, you know, I just wanted to do some quick housekeeping. Again, if you're if you haven't yet checked it out, be sure to check out the blog uh, page at www.harpnow.org. That's where the platform is. That's where the Harp platform. We have a resource page. We have the blog. And again, those are quick reads, usually less than five minutes, um, just to educate you. You know, give you some tidbits around the, these topics of harassment and assault. Uh, also, um, there's survey. There's two surveys, right? One is for the harassment and assault related in, um, climate change, and the other one is for police brutality climate change. Uh, sorry, climate survey, right? To understand, to be able to kind of take the temperature on where you know where do people stand in their in, in their experiences and you know ideas on regarding these incidents, right? That's because it's, it's important to take a you know a pulse on, what, on where we really are as a community currently, so that we can know like what changes may, may be needed for the community, right? So yeah, um, again, like if you're watching, please take a quick second to share, share this link, share this live. Um, if you're if, if you're picking up what I'm putting down, if you're, you know, relating to this subject, to this topic, or you know somebody who might be, you know, might find this useful, please do share this information with them. Um, and again, if you also like to volunteer or be a HARP ambassador right where you are, please Feel free to do so, you know, connect in the DMs and like, yeah, we're here. We're here for the global impact. We're here for the local change and local impact. And, you know, listen, at the end of the day, you are absolutely very important in this effort of eradicating abuse from all our communal spaces, right? Whether that's harassment or that's assault, we don't need it. Nobody needs it, right? So harp about it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, like when we talk about domestic assault and domestic violence, um, actually, before I do that, I will go ahead and invite Dr. Singh with us. Welcome, 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 welcome. Thank you for, Thank having, you for <laughs> having me here, Winnie. Thank you. Thank you for joining me. Um, yes. So, yeah. So I'm just going to get right into it. And then, you know, I will let you chime in as you see fit because like, like for me, like this, this is a very near and dear topic to me, uh, just in general, like on so many levels. And again, you guys will find out as the story unpacks. Um, but let's be honest, um, domestic abuse and domestic violence goes beyond that particular instance of when it happens, right? Domestic abuse 
is also happens to be prevalent literally in any and every community because folks sometimes forget and think oh that only happens over there that happens to those types of people and the reality is that it can happen in any community regardless of age gender sexual orientation religion um you know <laughs> economic income status or nationality what fam immigrant status it doesn't matter age Okay, like these and, and incidents are usually accompanied with what emotional abuse, financial abuse. You know, you see somebody exhibiting some controlling behavior. This is often a power play by the abuser, right? And, and ugh, fam, um, you know, and and let's, and let's be real. Like it oftentimes it also does result in physical harm to the person, physical, emotional, mental, long-term psychological impacts to the people, and not only those who are the victims or survivors of these incidents, but also those who happen to be in that environment, right? So even when we get when we bring in the ACEs, the adverse childhood experiences, for those who happen to survive those environments, like it, like we'll we will we'll be unpacking these components as we go along. But th th these are so important um, issues to talk about, and you know, the national statistics from the um, National Coalition Against Domestic Violence um, show that about 23% of women and 14% of men have experienced severe physical violence by an intimate partner um, during their lifetime. And on a given day, the domestic violence hotline um, nationwide receives over 19,000 calls. And, and like, to me, this is, this is, it's ridiculous because as high as that number seems, we also have to acknowledge the fact that a lot of other incidents still go unreport unreported. The majority of these incidents go unreported. And, you know, and intimate partner victimization is definitely, there's a correlation with a higher rate of depression and potential suicidal behavior and thoughts. And it is so important that we normalize having these conversations. We normalize, you know, folks getting the help that they need and folks saying, hey, this is a situation that I'm going through that I need help with. You know, and, and and kind of from that, you know, I'm a, I'm a let. I would love to, you know, kind of transition to Doctor Singh and just let you kind of unpack that for us, as 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 you know, you as, you as somebody who has had some experience in this in this uh, situation, and you know, I just want to give you the platform to share it in your story, in your own words. Go ahead, Doctor Singh. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, domestic violence and uh, domestic abuse can happen to anyone anywhere. It does not matter your age or gender or nationality or religion or status. However, certain things do put you at higher risk. Um, so women of color are at higher risk. Immigrants are definitely at higher risk. Um, if, you're, um, if there's a significant difference between the um, socioeconomic status between the two partners. So if one has the power to work and earn more money while the other is doesn't, uh, that increases the risk factor. Uh, uh, we know members of the LGBTQA community, they are at higher risk. The trans people are at very, very high risk. So yes, although it happens across the spectrum of society, there are certain categories that are at higher risk. Um, so although I have a medical background, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a social worker, I'm not here on my professional background. However, I'm here today to speak just from a victim's point of view, um, as a female, as a person of color, as an immigrant, and um, talk about what I went through. And if I can you know, share uh, my perspectives, it'll be just totally personally my perspectives. So to give my background, um, I was born and raised in India. Um, I pursued a medical education, so I am uh, qualified as a medical doctor. I did my residency in ophthalmology, so I was qualified as a eye surgeon. Um, my marriage was arranged, and in India, that's a very popular culture where the parents look at the credentials of the potential groom, and they arrange your marriage. Um, and in, in that culture, in that setting, it does work for majority of the time. Divorce rates are very low in India, and that doesn't necessarily mean everyone's happily married. But again, the culture is different, the settings are different, so mar marriages tend to live, or at least, you know, they stay married for a longer period of time. Uh, domestic violence and abuse, from the last I read about it, which was many, many years ago, 
um, is about four times higher amongst immigrants than it would be in their own countries of origin. So for example, for an Indian couple, domestic violence rate increases four times the minute they leave India and come to a different country. And the same, I believe, is across the spectrum for other immigrants. Part of the reason uh, that is true is because when you migrate, one spouse gets the, uh, the uh, visa to have the ability to work, whereas the other spouse comes as a dependent. Does not matter whether they're, uh, what their educational status is, whether they have a desire to work or not. Um, and that difference in status creates a power differential. And as soon as there's a power differential, it immediately morphs into a financial differential. And that, uh, a per that brings out the darker angels, if you will, in a person. So someone who has a propensity to be controlling, it doesn't express itself when the two partners have an equal status. So while I was in India, I was a doctor. He was, my ex was an engineer. We were equal, you know, more or less equal status in society, more or less equal socioeconomic status, equal power status. When we moved to Canada, we were Got both, we both, we were both uh, uh, immigrants. Again, we both held equal status. And when things, uh, I initially went there and I didn't have a job or anything. He was a student, but I was able to pursue a job when I wanted to. So I was able to uh, initially start off as a visual fields technologist in the neuro-ophthalmology department at the Toronto Hospital. I was able to write a grant. I got a grant from the Ministry of Health and uh, I was able to get an educational license. And then I was able to pursue a clinical fellowship. So I had opportunity. Uh, because of my status, because of my legal status that gave me the opportunity to pursue my career. I didn't have to do it. Um, and just because I had that status and the opportunity, although my marriage was not a happy marriage, there was um, that power differential was not there. So we had arguments, we had differences, we were not a happy marriage, but um, there was no, uh, no power play and abuse, so to speak. Uh, all that changed significantly as soon as we moved to the U.S. When we moved to the U.S., my ex-husband had uh, the H-1 visa, which allowed him to work. He came here as a faculty at Penn State main campus, and I got an H-4 visa, which is a spousal dependent visa, which does now does not allow me to work. So I. Um, was a stay-at-home mom. And at that time, I was fine with that because my son was just shy of his second birthday when we moved to the U.S. And those two years in Canada, when I was trying to juggle work and um, to being a mom, was extremely stressful. Um, he was constantly falling sick at daycare. I had to constantly take time off to take care of him when he was ill. My ex-husband didn't take a single day off. So all the doctor's appointments, the whole burden of being a parent was solely on my shoulders. So it was extremely stressful. And that was a huge reason why the quality of our marriage deteriorated rapidly. But I need to do it. <laughs> right. Uh, but as soon as we came to the U.S. and I was a stay at home mom, the way he treated me changed significantly. So he started saying stuff like, you know, you're a loser, you're a quitter, you sit on your ass all day, you don't do anything. Um, and I, that made me extremely unhappy. You know, I had invested decades of my life pursuing an education. I had put in a lot of hard work. I'm an ambitious person. I did not, I was not ready to give up my career. I was ready to take a right. break. Yeah. Because my son was young. I was ready to take a break because I noticed he needed me and I had to prioritize and I was okay to take a break and be home for a few years till he got older. Yeah. Um, but you know, um, I think the other partner and whoever does this and i don't mean to imply that only women give up their careers to be at home yes. I know in my own neighborhood i know there are some men who have done that and i appreciate that but if one spouse does more of the sacrificing or putting aside of their career than the other the other spouse owes it to the spouse to appreciate the sacrifice and be appreciative of what mm -hmm. they're doing for the family Right. Um, in my case, that was the opposite. Instead of being appreciative that I'm making a sacrifice and I'm doing what's best for the family, that was used against me to talk down to me. You're a loser. You're a quitter. You sit on your ass all day. Where what I was really doing all day was cooking and cleaning and mopping and scrubbing and cleaning the toilets and stuff was not my career plan. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, right. But that also goes to show right the reality of the narrative that goes with the work 
and the effort and the value that society often places on being a homemaker, being especially if the home person homemaker is a mo the mother or the female, right? I was like, like being a mother is like several jobs in one, and I think that's one of the things that I often try to remind women, especially like who who make that decision, that very tough decision to then become primary like homemakers. I was like, fam, make sure that you're very clear on the worth that you're, the, on the value that you're bringing into that role. Cause you know, like I, yeah, too often folks forget that um, that is like a full-time job that you do, that you never get off of. Most okay. often what happens is when the male member in the couple, in the family, does any work, he gets credit for helping out. When a woman does it, well, she's supposed to do it. It's not a big deal. It's, it's so your expectation. Like, it's like, duh, you're supposed to do that. But like, exactly. it's, it's like, guy holds baby. It's like, oh my God, look at him. He's a saint. He, he changed the diaper. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm, I don't mean to be like sounding condescending, but I'm like, but no, it's very real. It's like the work that women do in raising children right it's looked at oh it's default of course they should do that and like only i would i would say that only till recently have we began to see the shift of you know fathers or, or the paternal um role becoming like just as equally valuable and we've seen this even in covid right where finally they're like oh oh uh, uh, parents actually have to be parents of like they're, they're, there's lives outside of work what what do you mean like kids yeah. get sick or you have to homeschool or uh, like covid has really shown us that society could have accommodated for women's needs a long time ago yes. a long time ago but they just did not see the value in it until other people until it affected everyone the value in it, they probably don't want to give the value. See, that's mm. a power play on a systemic level. It's a power play. Yeah. On a yeah. systemic level. Even when women do step out, they don't get equal pay. They don't get no. equal opportunity. Mm -hmm. For a woman to step out of the house, uh, especially when she has younger children who need yeah. care while she's away from home, yeah, that job that she goes to has to pay her at least a penny more than what it costs her to step out of the house. Come on now. She has to either put the child in daycare or have a babysitter or whatever. But if she's not making enough or more, then it's no point. What's the point? Yeah, right. Um, mm -hmm. And then putting the kids in daycare, again, they're going to be in a group setting. They're going to share infections. Kids are very generous that way. Yes, <laughs> they are. <laughs> so a woman has to take more to, uh, But in general, women mm -hmm. tend to take the burden of that responsibility of having to take the time off again. Um, I do know there are some men who do that, so I don't want right. to sound as if I'm bashing men out there. <laughs> I know. Uh, but we know the statistics that majority of the time it's the women who it's end up doing the job. Correct. And again, I don't complain. I mean, if you are in a position that you can take time off and be at home and take care of the children, I highly encourage women to do that. And I think our society should start giving paid maternal leave to moms. Bam. Adequate, not just, that. Not, and that's the thing. Like, I feel like. No, I know because I've looked into these policies and oftentimes the the maternal leave policies are trash. Let's be honest. They're off, like it, it, far too often. They're not as accommodating as they really need to be because like six weeks, like let's say like somebody only gets six weeks. Six weeks is like you're, you're barely getting back to feeling like yourself. Let right. alone. Just that, that so when I went on, so in Canada, when I had my son, my son was born in April 1999. Oh. So it was a while ago. He's a handsome <laughs> 21 years old now. <laughs> right? But when I went on leave, I think I had the option of taking like nine weeks off or 12 weeks off. So I had uh, little options. I took the shortest time off. Mm -hmm. I was getting, I think, 80% of my pay. So whatever I was making when I was at work, I was still getting 80% of my pay as maternity leave benefits. Mm -hmm. And then when I was ready to go back to work, listen to this carefully. When I was ready to go back to work, mm -hmm. my boss said to me, now by law, they have to keep your position. They cannot eliminate your position because you're on maternity leave. You should have your position to come back to by law. Mm -hmm. But when I did say I want to get back to work, my boss at the time said, if you want your job, 
come back and start working, but on paper, keep collecting your maternity leave till the complete leave is there. Because if you don't do that, then you don't have a job. So he wanted me to come to work, but on paper still show that I'm on maternity leave. So the system abuses women 10 ways from Sunday. So here I am, you know, trying to get back to work because I don't want to lose my job, but I'm not getting paid my fair wages. I'm still supposed to show on paper right? my maternity leave. Uh, Plus now with my son being in daycare, he's constantly sick. So now I'm having to take time off. I'm the only one taking time off because my ex-husband wouldn't take a single day off. Oh. So imagine, imagine the psychological stress and trauma you go through because now you're sort of being used, misused, and abused from both the directions. And, and, yeah, and every, and every which way. And so <laughs> that, because you've got a young kid and you want to be able to take care of that kid. So when you're not, you know, you're not, you're not in a safe space emotionally. Exactly. And I, I juggled that for, uh, you know, for about 15 months. And then my husband got this opportunity to move to the U.S. And I'm like, okay, I'm taking a break. I can't do this. This was yeah. too stressful. I'm not enjoying my work. I'm not enjoying being a mom. I'm not enjoying anything. Um, mm -hmm. My marriage was going downhill rapidly. So I said, maybe I just need to take a break. Because mm -hmm. you know, you weigh, you weigh your options. What do you do? Yeah. End the marriage, end the job, or end being a mom? Oh, those, those are literally your options at that point. I was, I, I'm, I wasn't going to end being a mom. You know, right. you have a child. That's a lifelong responsibility. You need to take care of your children. I mean, at least I come from, that's my family value. My children are more important than anything and everything to me, including my own life. Oh, come on. Right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So don't give up on your kids. Job, mm -hmm. yeah, you can always get another job. That's what I yeah. thought at the time. Uh, marriage, I wasn't thinking of ending my marriage. was was definitely a very unhappy situation in my marriage. So I said, fine, maybe if I give up my job and be at home and take care of the family, my stress level will be lower. My quality of you know care to my child will be higher. And maybe my marriage will be saved. So yes. I made that choice. But when you make that choice, I was viewed as by this particular person, and I know there are others like that. Again, I'm not mm -hmm. pointing all men with the board. I all, <laughs> often get judged when I say I, this, you're a man hater, you don't mm -hmm. like men. And I'm like, that's not no. true. You're simply sharing your ex experience. And that's the thing, right? It's like, this is not an either or. This and is it's an and. To all men. There are yeah. wonderful men out there. Uh, right? there, are, there are lots of women I know who say, "Hey, I couldn't be half a mom if I was. It wasn't for the the dad. He's such a mom. great parent." So there are lots of great dads out there, you know. We, and we know that, exactly. but this, but this I, is get, I get bashed a lot for that when, whenever I speak up. Oh, you don't like men. You're a man hater, and I'm like, whatever. <laughs> but I'm like, see, and, and that's also part of why people oftentimes feel hesitant to come out. And, and say that, hey, these are the experiences that I'm having, or the, uh, these are the difficulties that I'm having in my marriage, right? Because, like, listen, there, like, for the, for, for these types of abuse to continue, there have to be people who support these people who perpetuate these behaviors. Like, they, they yeah. yeah, not having your tribe, not having your village around you, again, increases your risk. Oh, Talking come on. Factors. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. And again, I hate to bring this up, um, but like, so the, the, I, I kind of got, ro you know, roped into watching this random show, Married at First Sight, if you guys are aware of it. Married at First Sight, um, the one where people get matched up, speaking of arranged marriages, like they get matched up, whatever. And this particular season currently that I've just been like, I was like, why would they do that to these poor people? Like, like there's this one particular couple there that I'm just like, sis, like this is called abuse. Like with that, with that. a whole different discussion we can have about the so-called arranged marriage. You know, you can talk about its origin and the cultures and why that tradition has survived for so many centuries. <clears throat> because like in the Indian culture, I don't know, the video is frozen. Are you able to hear me? <clears throat> Abby, okay? Sorry, we got disconnected there for a second. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, yes, go ahead. 
talking about the arranged marriage. If you look at the mm -hmm. tradition, again, I don't want to bash arranged marriage in general either. Yes. In different cultures in different settings with the different tradition, that arrangement works for a lot of people. Correct. Especially when, when, when the parties have a say in it where, you know, they're able to genuinely say yes or no. Because I'm like, we have that those as well, like in Canada. Right. Like if you look at the Indian tradition, marriage is uh, considered not a marriage between two individuals. It's a marriage between two families. families. Correct. Right. So your family values have to be in agreement sort of. Yes. Um, um, but unfortunately, unfortunately, family values are, are evaluated based on socioeconomic status and religion and culture and education. And those don't necessarily apply the way you think. At the end of the day, today, in today's age, in the 21st century, individual compatibility has become more important. Mm -hmm. Race and culture and religion and all those. I'm not saying they are not important. They yeah. play their fair part. Mm -hmm. But individual compatibility, if two people get to know each other, respect each other, appreciate each other as individuals, then everything else, all right. of the differences, differences in race and religion can be easily overcome. Because I think those differences actually enrich a relationship. No, I, I absolutely agree on that. And, and it, you're right. Okay, perhaps we may have to have a whole other discussion on just like yeah, arrange, right. arranged situations, right? right? Because, yeah, of course, for me, especially with this particular show, it is like I look at specific couples and I'm like, it was just the, the poor, poor girl. It was like within the first week of it, um, like it was the person, the person gets intimate with her, right, very quickly on. Or rather, they engage in the the into the they they jump the intimacy aspect aspect of it, and then within the by the next morning, the person tells her, "Oh, I'm actually not that attracted to you. I'm not that into you, right?" And then, but but then continues to try to use the intimacy, the physical intimacy, as a means to say, "Oh, maybe it will grow if we keep doing this." So 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 the girl continues to engage in this activity, knowing that this person is not actually like interested in like having anything of value or long-term investment in it. And her reasoning was, oh, you know, she was hoping to have a honeymoon baby because that's what the family said they wanted, right? It's it's like this idea of like, I'm like, sis, like, what do you want? Don't you want like to be valued just simply for who you are in this like arrangement? Like, <laughs> I was like don't put their desires over your own like bodily autonomy. And then it was also like the girl brings up this idea of, she felt like it was part of her marital duty as a woman. Like, I was like, mm. right. I was like, but I was, and so that's one of the things I, that we actually, that I talk about quite often here is this idea of consent and bodily autonomy, especially as women. I was like, oh, same, thing for yeah. men, same thing for men. Men yeah. too, I should have bodily autonomy. And, uh, Absolutely. Um, and yes. to, Maybe not as frequently because that's what we learn from statistics, but men too undergo sexual oh. abuse and, oh. and manipulations. So again, Correct. Um, the numbers Correct. may not be even, but yes. it applies equally to everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. They identify themselves, even if they are, you know, male body identifies female. Yes. A human being should have the autonomy over their body. Absolutely. And their body should not be used as a object for manipulation. And the and the interesting part is sometimes we use our own body, mm. like you know, oh, yeah. when when a woman or when when a person is in love with another person, uh, they think the physical intimacy can help bring the other person in. So now the person's using their own body as an right? instrument to engage in a relationship that is probably not a healthy relationship. It, it, which it was not. And um and and it's it's for me it's one of those things where I'm like, oh my gosh, like we we as a community of women and sisters and perhaps even like in like in the various spaces, especially with religion, because like a lot again for her for her case in particular, she really continues to attribute her her allowance for for the abuse to continue on is that like she says you know she she attributes it to whatever her beliefs are right mm -hmm. and i'm like i don't think i don't think any like religion necessarily says you must endure suffering to receive to be loved or receive love or to be valued 
of you know of love. But yeah, oh, like that's yeah, that's crazy. And and we and and, and again, right, tying it back to domestic abuse and domestic violence. I've seen that even growing up, where women will stay in you know in these situations, you know, where they're saying perhaps it's for the children, or you know, I made a vow, you know, to be in this marriage, so I have to stay in it, or it will look bad on my family if I do that, or you know, he apologized promptly, so he, and he felt he felt really bad, and he said he would never do it again, and you know, it was a one-time thing, or was it just a two-time thing, or or I I provoked this response from this person. That's right? a typical textbook abuse. <laughs> You know, they like, abuse and they will apologize and they will yeah. abuse again. They will apologize. Oh my God, I've been through that. I have so been through that. <laughs> Say it. And, and then they will use that against you. So in my with my ex husband, <sighs> that dynamic was like a repeated cycle happening literally every three days. Every three Ooh. days. So, uh, wow. so he would he would quote unquote behave himself and mm. help around the house. Mm. And then, you know, when he's helping around the house, we would be fine. Mm -hmm. Then within three days, he would go back into doing nothing and trashing the house. Then we would have an argument and fight. Um, then he'll call me names, you're crazy, you're this, you're that. Wow. And then when I'm like, fine, hey, you know what? Do your own dishes, cook your own food, do your own stuff. I'm not your maid. Do it. And then he's like, oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said this, this, that, and the other. So he'll apologize. Then we'll it was just a cycle it was such a vicious cycle repeated itself and they and then he would turn it around and blame me that you're the crazy one one day you're happy one day you're angry one day you're happy one day you're angry i'm like uh yeah that totally depends on how you treat me <laughs> right right like, like folks forget that that is a factor it was like like you know consider how you're treating the other person exactly right like exactly. And, and that's the thing it's like and then they make you feel like you're the crazy one, right? Because like, we see he that a lot. He took that to a whole different level. He took that to a whole different mm. level. So see, that's the thing with abusive people. They will use your sensitive points, your soft points against you. So I lost my brother to suicide. Nobody mm. in the family saw that coming. So it was a real shock. So we didn't know him to be suffering from mental health. Yeah. We didn't know what he was going through. So the suicide just blindsided us and we were just shocked. Um, and uh, my mother, you know, of course, as a mother, yeah. no mother, no parent wants to outlive their child. So they, she was in, she went into acute deep depression. So she, she needed antidepressants and stuff. And my ex-husband started using that against me. Your brother was crazy. That's why he committed suicide. Your mom's crazy. That's why she needs to be on these meds and stuff. So that's a whole taboo around mental illness. Oh, that was gonna say like, right, like the whole the, taboo around mental illness. Nobody calls a cancer patient crazy. Nobody calls a diabetic crazy or a hypertensive right. crazy. But yeah, when you've got depression, you're crazy. Yeah, you're mad. Right. When you're going through it, like, and I'm like, and whether, whether it is a, you know, whether it's a, like a chemical imbalance, whether it's a, you know, brain, you know, the issue that has happened, a trauma that has happened, exactly. or whether it's a, you know, like psychological incident, you know, even yeah. breakups, breakups could at times. Circumstantial depression is. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Or and yeah. Know, and you know, a loved one, are, you go into depression. That's totally a physiological response. Yeah. And like people again it goes back to we haven't there's still a lot of stigma around a lot of stigma, you know, a lot of stigma. Es especially especially if you you know perhaps you have achieved a certain level of success also i also want to really highlight that aspect is like people assume well it's only struggling people who have the right to be upset or a right to be whatever but i'm like if you make a certain amount of money if you have a certain job if you have elevated and married xyz or like you have you you have children like what more do you like like what my rights do you have? Right. my you know? medical rights were violated somebody <laughs> accessed my medical records specifically looking for mental illness so that they could use that against me wow that person ended up losing his job because of that Wow, as they should. That, that's as, a federal offense, but but you exactly. see how mental illness is used as a weapon against a person, right? 
right? Yeah. And, that, and oh, my Leonard, of course, the person didn't find anything on the contrary, less Leonard losing his own job for doing that. But right. that's my point that mental illness is used as a weapon against the person suffering from it. It's such exactly. a double whammy. You're suffering yeah. from depression already, yeah. and now someone uses it as a weapon against you. That right. just that is that's just so inhumane to do that to someone. But anyway, that's what my ex-husband chose to do <clears throat> uh, on a daily basis. He could see I was extremely unhappy being a stay-at-home mom. Mm. I was extremely unhappy in the marriage. And he knew I was st sticking around because I didn't see an option. Mm. I was in a foreign land without my friends or family or anything. I can't work. I, my education is not recognized. I have a little kid that I need to raise. So for those reasons, I was pretty much stuck. I didn't know what to do. So I was just getting through one day at a time. And on a daily basis, I had to hear things like, you're a loser, you're a quitter, you're good for nothing. If you're not happy, go commit suicide, clear my way so I can go get married again and start my new life. You should be appreciative that you have this great life because you're married to me. Mm. Come on now. Right? So wow. after hearing it every day for about two or three years, I heard that. It's, I started internalizing it because I really didn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. You, you I can't help them. Yeah, because like, of my culture, right? Because of my culture, my own parents would not support a divorce or, or separation. Come on through, the, the, right? Bring on that cultural context, and that's I tell them like context. One of the things that I love that Dr. Campbell says often is like words matter, and I learned this from her. Words matter, context matters, right? And language matters. The way we express you know, what we are experiencing or what we have experienced or what is happening to us, right? Our tone of voice. Like yes. I, when I get passionate, I get to be loud, yes. my get big, and yes. everyone's like, are you angry? <laughs> <laughs> right, yes, I'm like, I'm allowed, I'm like, I'm allowed to be excited, like, because like, it, not everything is monotone. And I'm like, and if anything, like, it also helps like, ignite the passion in other people who who resonate with that experience people who people who recognize them like see i'm like that is me or like i've been there I'm like oh sis is talking to me right so i um, was stuck in this dark tunnel i couldn't see the light at the end of the day and you know what was really hurting me the most was i could see that i'm not being the kind of mother i want to be to my son say it mm, oh that's the worst thing you know I my son deserved the better of me but waking up and within the first five minutes of the day, getting into an argument with my ex-husband, mm -hmm. which just drained my energy, which just drained my emotions. And I just didn't have the energy or the emotions to be the mother I wanted to be to my son. And oh, yeah. that to me was like, that to me was like, okay, this is not acceptable. Oh, see, cause I was saying, I was, cause I was about to ask, I was like, so like, what was that final straw? And it seems like that, that was it where it's very like, like, this I is think... not my life. This is this, like, my life has better in store. Like this, this cannot be it for you. Yeah, you know? I needed to be, I needed to be myself to be there for my son. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when I called the crisis hotline. Wow. Cause I'm like, I need help. I know I can do better than this but I can't do it on my own. I need help. And I call mm. the crisis headline, hotline. And the best words I heard that still today I use to help me redirect my inner my inner voice. Yes. At the end of the day, you have to watch your inner voice. What Ooh. are you telling yourself? <sighs> Him telling me I'm crazy can have no effect on me until I take that and tell myself that, that yes, I am crazy. Mm, say that it. Fertilization has far more impact on ourselves than what somebody from the outside says, right? And that's what I was doing. I was internalizing his abuse and I was making it my truth. Mm. So Ooh. the best words of wisdom I got at that time was my 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 counselor I told me. So Anju, what would how would you respond if I told you, you know, let's just pick if I told you you're Chinese, you need to go to China. Mm, right? I'm like what? She's like, yeah, you're Chinese, you need to go to China. I'm like, I don't understand. Why would you say that to me? She's like, exactly. So next time your husband tells you, you are crazy, you need to go commit suicide, mm -hmm. translate that into him telling you, you're Chinese, you need to go to China. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, yes. Oh my God, yes. That's how out of context yes. his statement is. Yeah. You're yeah. Chinese, you don't need to go to China. Mm -hmm. You are not crazy. You don't need to go commit suicide. Oh uh, yeah, and yo, and I, yo, you, you really, you really, you dropped a really 
mm, serious gem there, right? right? Where you where you highlighted for us the fact that whatever they say doesn't matter until you like like adopt it into your internal voice. Right. And that's really what gets a lot of us is yes. you know when like I, it it sucks when I when when I realize I'm like oh my god my internal voice is being mean to me right? and we have to catch ourselves when that happens because because it happens more often than you know like when you begin to be more conscious of the way you not only speak about life but with the things you speak to yourself and about yourself especially inside your head till that today I have to catch myself till today till today yeah. and this is almost twenty years later. <gasps> I find I'm getting irritable or snappy or short. Yeah. I stop and ask myself, what's my internal voice telling me? And yeah. invariably it's because I'm not, I'm in, I'm in an unhappy place. Yes. And, and also often internal voice is, is not going well. And oftentimes I would have realized it, it was, it's words that other people said consistently about you. It wasn't stuff that you necessarily believed in yourself. It is once you allowed other people, somebody, with somebody else's narrative, you allowed that to become your internal narrative of self. Exactly. And I'm like, and and that and that's why there is, you know, that that contrast, that chaos, because it's like, it's two very contradicting realities. And I'm like, you're not going to find ease until you like take out the, that, that, real, that reality that is fake, that is not true. And I am, yo, thank you. Thank you. For and that's called being a Velcro person or having a Teflon layer. So mm. if you're a Velcro person, everything gets stuck to you. You make yeah. it your own. So all the yeah. fiber of negative energy, those bad words, those abusive behavior, that sticks to you and becomes part of you. And then you to have a Teflon layer. Mm. Teflon layer means those words just come and slip off. They don't attach to you. You, you don't make them your own. And God. that doesn't come easily to a lot of us, especially Again, a lot has to do with how you're raised. I was raised in a very conservative, traditional family. I know my parents love me. Mm -hmm. but there was a lot of negative talk in my family because, oh. because of my skin color. I'm the black sheep of the family. <laughs> Life. So that and that's a whole other conversation we can have. Which will life. happen. Tune in for that. It will happen. I will give you guys heads up. Right? But yes. because I had been raised hearing all of that derogatory stuff, yes. hearing more derogatory stuff was my norm. You, oh, come, oh, say it. That right? was your norm. And yo, and that's, that's why you don't recognize it as abuse because that's yes. your norm. Oh, wow. Right. That is, that is powerful. And the next thing that helped me, so here's, here's <clears throat> an important dynamic. Mm. Once I got that advice that next time he tells you, yes, you're crazy, you need to go commit suicide, in your mind, translate that into he's telling you you're Chinese, you need to go to China. Right. So next time when he did that, I just looked him straight in the eye and I literally <laughs> and I had this little smile on my face. <laughs> used to seeing me internalize that and he could I guess he could physically watch me breaking and, and that, they, giving him more power right on that yeah right. but when he saw it's not having its effect and I was fine I could look at him in the face and like I'm not being phased by it I mean I he could see the Teflon layer on me yes that him that triggered him Ex yeah, and it would and it would. would change the verbal and emotional abuse into physical abuse ooh, ooh, oh come on come on talk about it i know we're, we're at that 42 minute mark but come on let's talk but about that's it. what let's changed get the verbal and emotions right. see i didn't recognize emotional abuse as abuse i just thought i'm in a bad marriage it's a bad dynamic it's just an unhappy marriage we don't get along I didn't, I didn't put the word abuse to it and I didn't foresee physical abuse. Right? Cause like we're taught, we're taught that oftentimes that abuse has to be once somebody physically makes a physical action on you. Like exactly. until he hits you, until he smacks you, until he pushes you, until he punches you, then it's not abuse. But I'm like, no, we're like, and that's why I love this platform. And that's why like that physical I'm, abuse for me was like, uh oh, no, yeah. no, 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 no. You but, but, line there. Yeah, by the time it gets to assault, there's oftentimes a lot of harassment and other non-physical abuse behavior that occurs before like they somebody doesn't just wake up one day and be like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit this person that I'm saying that I love or care about. Like they don't wake up just one day and do that. It's like, no, it's because they have pushed. They have been, as that saying goes, they've been in a habitual line stepper and line pusher, right? For a exactly. long time. It was like, they didn't just wake up and hit you. It was like, they said something. 
they cross your boundaries of, of, of respect, right? They And they push it all along until they like uh, they realize, oh, this thing that I've been doing is no longer working. I have to elevate to the next thing, right? And, and they're comfortable knowing that they can do it and get away with it. That part. Because yes. I had a friend once tell him, I had a friend from Canada visit me and spend a weekend with me, mm. uh, her husband. And mm. I, at the end of the weekend, she did tell my husband at the time that things are not going well. Anju is not happy. You need to do something mm. about it. And his response was, she's been here seven, eight years. She ain't going nowhere. So they start taking you for granted because he knows I don't have an option. I have no family here. I can't mm. work. I can't do anything. See, in Canada, when things weren't going well, I got a job. I got my own apartment. I moved out. Wow. When in Canada, I was uh, we were not getting along. Yeah. I got a job. I got my own apartment. We weren't living together in Canada. Wow. But in the U.S., I didn't have that option. So he knew I'm not going nowhere. Mm. He knew my, my own family would encourage me to come. My own father, when we finally did separate, my yeah. own father came to the U.S. to tell me, to tell me. Back that a little bit of physical violence is part of normal, healthy marriage. Okay. And that's when I told my own father that, you know what? You might as well hang a picture of mine next to my brother's because as far as you're concerned, I'm already dead. Yeah. Because if I stay in this marriage, I'm already dead, either physically yeah. or emotionally, I'm already dead. So you might as well hang my picture next to my brother's because I can't, I can't, I can't yeah. stay here. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to survive. But if I survive, I'm on my yeah. own. And if you can't accept this decision, then I'm as good as dead for you anyway. And for two years, my dad didn't know what to say to me. After two years, after two years, he wrote me a long letter mm -hmm. realizing. Mm -hmm. So my father is traditional and conservative, but he's also yeah. very broad minded. Yeah, it takes a bit of conflict of this new age where you're trying to follow your tradition, you're trying to follow your culture, you're trying to follow your religion, but your oh. intelligence and your logic and your empathy and your compassion tells you that they're in conflict. Come on, sis. You have to break those shells, you have to mold, you have to evolve. And yes. I think my father went through that during those two years. Correct. And he wrote me a long letter. He literally apologized. He's like, I'm sorry, I totally screwed your life up. Come on. It's like, uh, supposed to be the best years of your life, and I'm so sorry I put you through this. Mm. And I told my dad, you know what? You did the best you knew how to do. Right. Oh, and 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 let's be honest, right? And those two things, and that's what I keep saying. I keep I keep having to remind folks, it's it's not always an either or, right? Because exactly. there there are seasons where, especially like where folks recognize and kind of that light bulb finally goes on, like, oh my gosh, like oh, my ideology is outdated. So, and, and, and again, for me, especially like as, a, as an African woman, you know, a black woman, I reckon like for me, like those, it sounds bad, but I'm like, those, are, those, are, yeah, it's, it's, those are very it's real. There, the, there's a, those are very real ways of thinking and normalization that goes on in our communities. Right. And, and, and the, and this is an issue that has been especially exacerbated during COVID. We've seen the numbers, especially for domestic violence or child abuse. There's the, we've seen a spike um, in reporting. But again, also, I was like, obviously, because I and, and then like that also now changes the perception of what workplace harassment looks like. Because like now people are working from home. Your home is your office now. So now your harassment, your abuse has is like overflowing into the place where you're supposed to be able to work, right? We used to be able to escape to work, but now you're stuck at home and this person is like, oh, I just have more access to you. And that is scary. That's a scary place to be. And I'm like, wow, you know, right? And and, 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 and I'm glad that you're, you're, you're really like dropping some serious gems here today, right? Highlighting this reality that sometimes the people who are ideally supposed to be the ones who are your protectors and like the people who are supposed to be able to be like, hey, that is not cool. Like you shouldn't be in that because of the way society has indoctrinated certain ideologies, they they see abuse as normal. And even as women or any victim, right? We normalize being victimized because society has told us time and time or sh and, and showed us time and time again that that is an acceptable way to treat someone 
Right, and my husband still enjoys his uh, tenured faculty position at Virginia Tech. He was he I had a I had a pr protection from abuse order against him, which he violated several times. He would come back into the house. He was evicted from the house, but he would come back and said, "If you call the cops on me, I'll stop paying the mortgage. I'll stop paying the bills." And even when we did finally separate, what I got in spousal support and child support, the both things put together didn't yeah. pay the mortgage, let alone the utilities, let alone childcare, let alone groceries, let alone all the other expenses. Both child support and spousal mm. support put together did not mm. even pay the mortgage, let alone everything else. So. And you wonder why women, not you, but like folks really wonder why women like stay longer than they really need to and for me like also like we also find that there are also instances where it is the women who is the higher earner right but they still find themselves stuck in these situations because again of those ramifications of when you try to leave what happens it gets worse before it gets better here's the sad statistic that i read and it was so eye-opening to me and because of the actions I've taken in my own life since then have been so freeing for me. Mm. So an abused woman leaves, I believe, 11 times before she yes. finally leaves. Correct. And then when she does finally leaves, she's seven times at a higher risk of being in another abusive relationship, which could be worse than the first one. Yeah. yeah. And because I've lived through that, and I'm like, mm-hmm. I'm not even setting foot into that arena anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, yo, that is that is legit the truth. Like that is that is that is the reality. That's the lived reality of what we know about the neurochemistry of uh, of being a victim of domestic violence and abuse <laughs> is. Um, uh, uh, you're you're more likely to be in another abusive relationship. The way I translated it, like if I were to meet a man, if I'm attracted to the man, he's probably an abusive man. <laughs> so I should stay away from him. Mm, mm. If he's not an abusive man, I'm not attracted to him. I don't want to him anyway. <laughs> right, isn't that crazy? Like, yo, but but the, yo, listen. Oh, that right, that goes back to like learning how to date and like you no, know, like things we wish we knew then, which is which is another like topic that I'm going to be having uh, soon. Is like the things we wish we knew back then. Right, because because you you as the woman who knows what you know now at the age you are now, it's like you put up with. I'm sure you you've learned to put up with way less BS than you did when wow. you were younger. Like if if you like yeah. right, because even me, I was like, if I look back, if I would have gotten married like at that 21 year old or at 25, it, you there's a it's a very different level of like the things that I'm willing to put up with of like mm, that is not my ministry I'm gonna keep it moving you know right, um right. and and it is so important like yo which is why I, I really appreciate it. just recognizing when you're being used when you're being recognizing where to draw your own lines yeah don't draw our own lines we allow ourselves to get reeled into something thinking it'll get over he'll change Ooh. maybe i can fix this and, and and we just sink deeper and deeper into it by the time we realize how far we are we've really done ourselves some big damn damage that part that and again because we are not bob the builder ladies or gentlemen we are not that is not that is not your ministry i was like listen if he wants a wife let him prepare for one before you get there if he wants a husband if they want if we want husbands prepare before you get there right it is not your like you sure you can be the best person that you can be and if somebody chooses to you know walk that walk with you may they do that from a place of health healthy love do not do not bend over backwards to the point of potentially killing yourself in the name of, but I'm saving this other person. No, 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 no. Toxicity tends to go to to travel more towards polluting that which is unpolluted than that which is not polluted. You know, cleaning out the toxicity. Let's be honest. That's usually how. I know we're running out of time, yeah. but I do one last thing I want to say. One thing that helped me, as I said, was what my counselor said. If someone tells you something negative, translate it in your head. They're telling you you're Chinese, you need to go to China. Yeah. Secondly, when you're doing a lot of that negative self-talk, yes. look at yourself in the mirror. And pretend mm. the reflection you're looking at is a reflection of your best friend. If your <laughs> best friend comes and tells you, I'm terrible, I, I'm a failure, I screwed up this, and I'm a loser, and I'm never gonna get better. 
pretend that your best friend is doing that talk to you. What yeah. would you tell your best friend? Yeah, you're a loser, you're a quitter, you should just give up, you should not even try. Are you gonna tell your best friend that? No! If you're not gonna tell like, your best friend that, then why do you tell yourself that stuff? Yeah. Oh, that is, oh, that is. And I literally teach my daughters the same thing. I said, yeah. treat yourselves yeah. like the queen you are. Come on. Because if you don't treat yourself like the queen you are, why would anyone else? That part. Right? I, yeah, yeah. I'm like, it's be your me. biggest advocate. Be be right. your biggest champion, your biggest fan, your biggest advocate. Absolutely. And that's the thing. I'm glad that you listen. I know, I know we're running out, so I'm just gonna do a quick recap, right? We we've highlighted the importance of changing or being mindful of your internal dialogue. Don't make other people's misperceptions of who you are become your internal dialogue. That's number one. Number two, um, right? Being a, a being being okay with getting them assistance, mental whether that's mental health, whether that's you know the financial assistance to get out of that situation, whatever help you can get, if it's legal legal assistance, get it, right? Be willing to take that step of saying I I deserve better. I deserve better, and hopefully it you know it's not at the point where it's too late. You know, the only time that it's too late is if you're no longer breathing. And we definitely don't want you to get there. We want you to be able to get help as soon as possible. And, you know, obviously, you know, understanding that you're like, you're not alone. And like, you know, times have changed as much as, you know, we say not much and a lot has, you know, a lot has changed, but not much has changed. And like times, have, at least times have evolved to the point where we no longer have to stay in those, in those situations right? Because of society or what we think other people think or what we think, you know, our families may think about. No, um, this issue of domestic abuse and domestic violence, like this is real. And it happens to people across the, the spectrum. It doesn't matter how rich you are or, you know, if you're, you're, you're broke or if, or if you're, you're an immigrant. But again, as Dr. Singh said, these are underlying factors that could increase your risk of exposure to these incidents. And we want to make sure that you're well informed. Um, and so, also, like, yeah, quick, quick plug back again on Harp. Um, you know, you can Harp, you can Harp it. Uh, click if you go on the website, click the Harp it buttons. You have the one for the harassment and assault, and you have the separate button for the police uh, brutality related incidents. Feel free to Harp it because that's also part of how we get to have a clearer understanding of the prevalence of these incidents in society. Because we, first of all, have to get very real and very honest about how, like, how prevalent are these situations happening in, 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 our, in our own communities. We, we, have, we have to co come to account first and foremost there. And, and also be able to get contextual data, because that's currently what's missing. There is no, there's very minimal context around these numbers associated with abuse, of harassment and assault. And that's, what, that's one of the key aims of, of HARP, is making sure we're collecting contextual data to, to be able to provide people the bigger picture, right? Because again, just like you and you saying, there is a story behind that single data point that says this is this is a person who has experienced abuse. This is a person who has experienced harassment, right? Or assault. Like there is a story to be told. There's a story to be understood. And that's where oftentimes people connect, especially if we're saying we want to see real policy changes about how you know folks are helped and supported in society and throughout the community. Let's make sure that we are collecting the necessary data. Let's make sure that we are providing the context required and make sure that you out there are staying vigilant, not only when, you know, as, as a witness, like not only to the people that you know, but even for a stranger out there, you never know what advocacy can do for the next person because people, people are hurting out here. People are hurting and we want to make sure that, you know, you get connected to the correct resources. HARP has a resource tab. If you would like to be added to our resource page, please feel free to reach out. That's at www.harpnow.org. If you would like also to support, buy the merch, it's on there on the store page. But again, we would like to continue highlighting folks' very real lived experiences because that's what, that's what, you know, helps folks see themselves they, and helps us to, you know, inspire change in ourselves and in others. And before we go, Dr. Sig, do you have any other, you know, last takeaway points? Or if you have any any initiatives that you'd like to plug for yourself, go ahead. I'm gonna give you a couple more seconds to go. Thank you. Thank you. In the future, if you wanna have us talk about how to take other people's negative energy and mm. turn it into something positive action, that is the key to happiness. 
when you take other people's negative energy and turn it into something positive and a positive action yeah it's so freeing because now no matter what other people tell you yes derogatory stuff once they know you're going to use that as a fuel to light the fire within you to do something beautiful out there yes they have no incentive to be derogatory towards you <laughs> You see what I'm saying? So no matter what other people tell you, if you can turn that into something positive and do something good out there for yourself or for the people around you, correct, it's the best way to end evil in our society, I think. Yeah. Right? Oh, um, yeah. For plug-in, um, you know, I'm running for Pathonatory in Dauphin County. We need to change the good old boys club. It's been a good yeah. old boys club for way too long. They take our money. Uh, they don't do nothing for us. Mm. They get our tax dollars. Um, I'm a single mom. I work four different jobs. And Ooh. I just found out I pay more taxes than Donald Trump does. And trust me, I don't have one millionth of the bank account money that he claims to have. <laughs> <Okay>? <laughs> so I think that's very yes. unfair that we have to work so hard and our blood, sweat, and tears is given off as tax money. And I'm a total supporter of paying taxes, but I don't see my tax money going to other um, single moms trying to make ends meet to, support, to support victims of abuse. I'd rather see it go back. I want my tax dollars to go back into the community to make our community a better place. I don't want our tax dollars going to the good old boys club, increasing the disparities between the races because that's literally what these politicians are doing. Correct. We are getting paid yes. full-time full wages with benefits for jobs they don't show up for while they spend their time pursuing their own law practices and developing their own properties and becoming richer and richer off of our tax money. While we continue to suffer, we continue to bleed and suffer sweat and cry to put food on the table. That is not okay. So I want to change that. I told y'all she was awesome. Come on. <laughs> I told y'all. <laughs> I come through for y'all. I do. And I will continue to do so. And Dr. Singh, first, listen, thank you. Thank you so much for your willingness to just A, share your story. Because I think that is so important in this journey of normalizing having these conversations. And more importantly, also for being an active voice and you know champion for positive change in a community um and and as she told you i'm like please please break down give give the people a quick second i'm like that particular position because i feel like a lot of people also are, are unfamiliar that that is even a voted position no it's like the best kept secret in politics right yeah <laughs> so the pathonatory's position the pathonatory the word pathonatory is derived from proto notary uh, so it's a notary position. It's like a it's 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 like the clerk of courts, but the clerk of courts is on the criminal side. Prothonotary is on the civil side. So all civil cases like landlord tenant disputes, um, uh, uh, divorce decrees, change of name, all of these, all the civil cases go through the prothonotary's office. I know I've been through custody issues. All my custody paperwork goes through the prothonotary's office, right? right? Uh, um, but the prothonotary himself, I've never met the or herself. Ah, you see my post today morning in the Constitution of Pennsylvania. It's a he. Exactly. I was it's like historically been a he, right? So mm -hmm. we got yes in front of it. I was, I was like, why gotta be a he? And yeah. that's what, it's become like a family business because uh, prior to the current prothonotory, the person who was a prothonotory, between him and his father, they were prothonotories for 35 years. It was like their own private family business off of our tax dollars. Come on now, say it. Right? Um, so my question, and I'm still researching and trying to understand that, talking to other counties and how they're doing, why they're doing the pros and cons, I'm looking into all that. I'm mm -hmm. questioning the very existence and the need for this position. Should mm -hmm. this position because a lot of the other counties don't have this position anymore. Mm -hmm. If there is a need for this position, should it still be elected? Should it be appointed? Because a lot mm -hmm. of counties now have it as an appointed position, even if they have it. Okay. Right? okay. Um, and if it should be an appointed or elected position, should it be a full-time or a part-time position? If you're in the office part-time, you get paid part-time. Yeah, like, part mm -hmm. like the rest of us. Like the rest of us. So that's what I'm looking into. And I, I understand there are pros and cons of each side. Yes. You know, I want this to be a public education awareness issue. The exactly. public should have a voice in it because we, the people, run this country. And we, the people, need to be engaged in this conversation. Say it. Do think this position needs to exist? Do you think there's a reason why it should be an elected position? Because say I do become the pathonatory and you're coming in for a custody issue or a landlord tenant issue, it shouldn't matter to me whether you're Republican or Democrat or what. 
Thank the you. way I process you, the services I provide to you remain the same no matter what. Correct. So that is the political position. From what I'm seeing, what it appears like to me, this position is a political position because it's just another oil in, uh, um, greasing the whole good old boys club machinery. Come on through. On Come our through. tax dollars. It's not doing nothing for the public. Our prothonotory isn't doing nothing for us. Mm. Mm. Come on he now. He needs to use his time to promote other Republican candidates, post their signs, post their stuff, be part of their campaign. So he's just another drop of oil greasing that machinery, not on our tax dollars, not on our tax dollars. You can do that. You have the freedom and the right to do that, but not when you're collecting our tax dollars. Say it. Right? So I want to challenge the system. I want to question the system. I want to bring this information out to the public because a lot of people don't seem to know about it. Um, and let the public voice their opinion. Mm. Right? Mm. Let the public speak up. Listen, uh, and that's on Mary had a little lamb if you get it. <laughs> but yeah, like uh, there, there's nothing else for me to add at that point. Like there. There, there's no more to be added. So um, yeah, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you so much. And thank you, our viewers, our listeners. If you're unable to catch us during the live, please you know, join us on the second and fourth um, Sundays at 2 p.m. That's here at Let's Harp About It. You can join us on the social media platforms, Facebook, I, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, all that good stuff. You can connect even from the website. And our social media handle is at HarpNow. Org. That's at H A R P N O W O R G. Thank you, and we look forward to catching you on the next Let's Harp About It. Bye, guys. Thank Take you. care. Thank you so much.